so we left last, uh, off last class with uh, Satan having asserted uh, hit that the mind is its own place and in itself can make a heaven of hell a hell of heaven. It doesn't matter where he is. Uh, his mind has sovereignty over itself. Um, and that means that although he has been removed from the even the precincts of light in heaven and is in this dark pit so far removed from the presence of God that there's no light there at all and he has lost his luster to put it mildly as have the rest of the archangels who followed him down into the pit um, that there is still something there which God cannot touch that he is remain sovereign over his own mind and with that he proposes and he, and he will not submit and he will not repent for that matter and so he presents himself in very heroic terms in terms that I think are it's a very rousing speech in, in defeat to admit no loss whatsoever uh, despite the magnitude of the loss. So you can see it one of either two ways, and I think we need to see it on both levels. On the one hand, it is a great speech uh, of uh, refusal to um, admit defeat. So we, we admire this as a character trait. It's resilient um, and, and so forth. At the same time, we also have to see that it is totally delusional, entirely delusional. So. And I think we are supposed to understand Satan as a deluded being and maybe drinking his own Kool-Aid, perhaps, as we would say it. He is, is he, does he actually believe what he is saying to the others? And it's not entirely clear uh, that they believe it or they're just willing to believe it because it motivates them to further rebellion. But for the, the reader, we don't have to buy into either point of view. We can remain a little bit suspicious of this being, uh, particularly since Milton is writing, writing for a Christian audience. He is assuming that, first of all, that people know the uh, account of the fall of mankind in Genesis. Remember, he's writing this in uh, 1670 thereabouts, and uh, the English Civil War has been fought between the royalists, uh, the Catholic royalists, and the king's been executed, and the Puritans have taken government under Cromwell for a decade or so. Cromwell is now defeated. Milton, when he writes this, by the way, uh, is under house arrest, blind. I don't know if I said this in, in my lead up to this. He, he was the minister of tongues, so he spoke on behalf of the Cromwell's government to the European powers that were threatening to invade England when uh, Cromwell and the uh, Republican army executed the king. Because all the monarchies in Europe were concerned that what was happening in England would also be replicated on the continent, and we can't have that. And uh, so Milton was a defender of uh, the, uh, the Republic. And that, it's interesting also just historically when we look at um, the Republic that Milton asserts against the empire or the tyranny of Charles I, this is how they would have seen it, and compare and contrast that to uh, the scenes in Virgil's day when, when the uh, Roman Empire is just beginning and the fall of Rome uh, as a Republic has happened. So it's, it's, it's inverted in a sense. So, but these are epoch marking uh, events, and, but Milton comes forward as a defender of liberty uh, and talks about Charles I as, as a tyrant and a, and a liar and, uh, and it being impossible to work with him. He suspended Parliament for years, by the way, Charles I, because the, the, um, the local uh, aristocrats would not, or, or the MPs would not give him money to fund his wars. He wanted to do various things and he requir required Parliament to give him the money. There's a shared governance at this point, they refused to do so. So he 
took it upon himself to suspend parliament and therefore the good governance of the entire country. And this had gone back and forth for over a decade and eventually uh, there were skirmishes fought, eventually a war fought, and eventually Charles having reneged on his uh, end of the bargain for long enough, they said, that, look, this man is a, uh, a tyrant and he is beyond redemption. We cannot work with this man. So they cut off his head and uh, announce a republic and the republic governs for, as I say, about a little over a decade and Milton is one of the defenders of the republic. On, he comes back from Europe, he's in, Ital in Italy at the time, comes back to, to write on their behalf. But by the time he writes Paradise Lost, uh, he is blind, he's lost his sight, and uh, Cromwell is dead, died of natural causes, there's no natural successor, and Charles II has come back from France and is now the King of England. And some want Milton to be executed for his uh, role in Cromwell's government, friends intercede on his behalf, says, look, he's a blind old man. Uh, he didn't chop off the king's head. He wrote pamphlets, etc. but we'll, we'll just leave him alone. While he's blind under house arrest, he writes Paradise Lost. He, when I say he writes it, he does not write a word. He uh, dictates it, and then somebody else writes it down, his daughter, because he can't see. So this is part of the miracle or the wonder of the, and the mythology of Milton writing Paradise Lost is the man who defends liberty, Christian liberty, um, is a blind poet, just like, interestingly, Homer was said to be. So again, there's a real myth surrounding the, the, the figure of Milton. But when he asserts that the mind is its own place, that is Satan, he seems to be um, arguing against God as a tyrant. That's the language here of tyranny and liberty. Remember he says, that I'm, I'm free here in hell. God is not going to be envious of me here. Here I can be free and that's what I want. And so he sounds like a freedom fighter does Satan. And he's striking that note which resonates and has resonated by the way this text has been read by other generations in other countries, including during the Arab Spring. This became a very popular text ironically, uh, because it was read in as a sort of an allegory for, um, and Satan as the hero, as it were, speaking against the, the tyranny of heaven. Um, so read in a different context, sort of applied that way. Yes, question? So where does Satan say the mind is the same Oh, book one. We left off there last time. Right there, line 254. The mind is its own place and in itself can make a heaven of hell, a hell of heaven, what matter where, if I be still the same and what I should be, all but less than he whom thunder hath made greater. So the only difference between God and me is he's got power. That's it. But as far as justice and, uh, and greatness, I am his equal, at least, if not superior, because he's morally inferior, because he's had to use force. Might makes right. That makes him a tyrant. God's a tyrant. That's what Satan is saying. Now, what's interesting is that language there, which is very much presenting Satan as a freedom fighter, um, is at odds with the truth of the situation. It's, it's, I don't want to say it's fake news. He's a liar. He's an outright liar. Uh, gaslighting is what we would say these days. He's accusing God of the very thing that he is. Yeah, that's what he's doing. In hell, there's a lot of gas being lit. <laughs> and Satan's lighting it and accusing God of the very things that he himself is. And we're going to see that Milton uh, presents that because when he moves from this, he moves off like a, um, like a, like a serpent on a lake. And he's compared to all manner of tyrants from past and present, but among other things, a dragon and a beast and um, the sojourners of Goshen in Genesis. Um, and, uh, and, and again, they speak, to, he speaks to the fallen angels and then refers to the, none other than the great sultan. He's compared to the great sultan, the sultan of um, 
the Ottoman, Turkish Ottoman Empire that threatens the Christian world right at that point. That's what Satan is compared to. And he's also compared to all sorts of other um, Old Testament tyrants, prince of Egypt, etc. So he says that God's the tyrant, and then Milton presents him in all uh, the biblical associations of being a tyrant. It, so it's unambiguous to the reader who has any sense of the allusions that Milton is using. And by the way, when I say allusions, I'm using a capital A. He's alluding to these things. These are passages in other literary genres, sometimes classical, sometimes biblical, and he expects us to recognize those allusions. And they add richness to the portrait. And this is part of the epic language here. So Milton, uh, Milton Satan calls God a tyrant. Milton, the writer, depicts Satan as the tyrant because Satan does not care for anybody's liberty because liberty is associated with virtue. Christian liberty is always associated with virtue. Liberty without virtue is license. If you, if, if you are not allied with justice, you are not appealing to freedom, you're appealing to, as I say, licentiousness. You can do whatever you want without consequences, without uh, considering good and evil. Well, that's exactly what Satan does. He casts aside considerations of goodness to gain greatness, and then he accuses God of being the power player. So as I say, it's gaslighting on an epic scale. That's good. That was good. I like that. Epic scale. It's an epic. Very clever. So then what does he do? Well, he's in, he is down in hell, and he proposes a great consultation. So they decide to have a big meeting, a big church meeting in the basement. That was unfortunate. Uh, but deep, dark, down, dark in hell, they have a, a consultation. Just like in the uh, pagan epic does in heaven. But here he has it in hell. And so there's a sort of a mirroring going on here. Note that we have not yet got what we find in the classical epic, which is uh, a look at what's going on in heaven. Like normally in the Odyssey, the Iliad, the Aeneid, we right away see what the gods are talking about in relation to events going on earth. We don't have that here. It begins in hell, it stays in hell. We don't even get to heaven to book three. And for, for, for some people that might suggest that Milton's hero is actually Satan because all of the attention in the epic for the first two books is focused on Satan, right? So he's getting a lot of attention, which is uh, uh, very unusual. If he's just following the template of the classical epics, then you might think that he is. Uh, Milton's here. And this is what the Romantic poets thought, by the way. We haven't got to the, Mil the, the Romantics yet, but they will argue that Satan was Milton's hero. Even though Mil Milton is a Christian and Satan is clearly the bad guy in scripture, they will say that Milton was of the devil's party without knowing it because he was a true poet. So they take the, the representations in Paradise Lost as a way of reading it as not literal, but as, a, as an allegory. And, it's a, and so Satan here is not really the figure of Satan in scripture. It's a figure of um, that, that's symbolizing something else, but not the figure of Satan. Now, I think it's a wholly um, impossible reading myself. I don't think that Milton could possibly have meant this. But that's how, the, that's how the Romantics read it. They interpret it this way, in part because they're reading in the light of the French Revolution, and they see themselves on the side of the French revolutionaries. And they think that they want to read Milton to be like them, and therefore against all forms of uh, rule, because they're effectively um, uh, on the side of the revolutionaries and therefore of against all forms forms of authority that's it's a strong take on what tyranny is but uh, let me not get uh, off track with that but there is a council in heaven in heaven in hell on what they should do at this point and various figures come forward to propose what they ought to do and there there's a few suggestions here one is that they Go at them again to battle. Okay, pick up your weapons and rush at heaven right again. 
That's, that's the one suggestion from Moloch, who's fierce, indomitable. The others are like, eh, that's not a very good idea. <laughs> but the full frontal assault after we've just been catastrophically defeated, I don't think that's going to work. Uh, another proposes that they, hmm, let's see here. You know what? There might be good stuff under the floor of hell here. Let's maybe dig for a bit. Maybe there's some gold down there. That's mammon. He proposes that they dig and find out what might be there. Um, Belial uh, suggests a third uh, course of action. In the end, Beelzebub suggests that they deceive. They try and, there was this rumor in heaven before we left that God was going to do something new. And that was to create a creature in his own image called mankind. He was going to create that. So let me say something about that, uh, because there's a bit of a timeline issue here. A and remember I said that in the epic tradition, or maybe I didn't say it last time, but I'll repeat it. In the epic tradition, uh, the, the, the work begins in the middle of things, in medias res, right? So for example, last semester, in the Odyssey, we begin, uh, 10 years after the Trojan War is over, which means 20 years since the Trojan War began because it was a 10-year war. 10 years to bring the walls of Troy down and then another 10 years for the Trojans or the, the Greeks to come back from the Trojan War. So it's 20 years in and we've, we start with Telemachus, Odysseus' son, now a 20-year-old boy or a man, not knowing what to do. And his household is surrounded by suitors and his mother is going to have to marry one of them. And this seems very unjust. The heroic Odysseus, who was a war hero, um, nobody knows where he is. He's been lost in battle, and his son doesn't know how to act. So it begins that. And then it backtracks in the epic to show us what happened that led up to this situation. And then only then does it go forward. Same thing is happening here. And I, I just need to say that because it actually needs to be filled in. So when Satan and his rebel cohorts are found here in hell at the beginning, that's because there's something that happens even before this. And that's to be found in book five, which we're not even gonna read. But that's why I'm telling you. In book five, there's a, a war in heaven. And it happens before the creation of the world. Chronologically, uh, so on, uh, on book, and, and the, the event that precipitates the rebellion is the exaltation of Messiah. Book 5, 572, if you're interested. He is, he is going to be crowned, Psalm 2. He's going to, he's going to be crowned as God's uh, chosen regent. And Satan Lucifer is outraged because he thinks that he deserves the honor that Messiah gets. And so the thought of his superiority to Messiah and his refusal to bend the knee to Messiah leads to a rebellion in heaven, which leads to a war in heaven. That's in books five and six, and leads them to be driven down into the abyss, which is where we meet them at the beginning. So I, you wouldn't have known that. I, I teach Paradise Lost the whole thing when I do my course on Milton. That's an advanced upper division level course. I'm not going to do that here. But just so you know how we get to this point in the epic. Um, and, I, and I'll talk more about that uh, when, when we come to that. But Satan at this point is down below and he wants to recover uh, the ground that they lost in the beginning. So he begins in the middle of things. And it's then going to recapitulate how we got to this point. And it will deal with the creation of the world, it will which is going to be recounted, and, and Adam's discovery of Eve and all of that. That's going to come after this. But chronologically, it's come before this. But in the account, it comes after. So there's a lot of moving stuff, pieces around here. Never mind. I don't even know why I bother telling you that. Um, so there's a council here in heaven. They decide that they're, oh, I know why, because they're going to defraud man, which they have not yet seen, but they've heard. 
it, he's going to be created. And they say, you know what? We can't defeat God by battle. That's like the utmost folly. But maybe we can deceive that creature who is made in God's image and that might grieve God. Let's do that. And they all agree on it. And then they say, okay, so that's a great idea, but who's going to go do that? Who's the one who's going to decide to leave this place as bad as it is and go up there and risk the consequences? And they decide, because it was all a, uh, basically set up, that Satan's going to go do it. And the reason it was a setup, they arranged that. And then all the other angels said, oh, yes. And they praise him uh, for going forward uh, on their behalf. So he goes up. And as he goes up, we're going to see a few figures. Let me, let me skip all the way over to that. I'll pick it up at 570 thereabouts. Is that... Yeah, there we go. No, it's not 578, it's 629. So Satan is going to go on their behalf to see if he can pervert mankind, whom they've all heard about. And so I'll pick it up. Meanwhile, the adversary of God and man, Satan, with thoughts inflamed of highest design, puts on swift wings and towards the gates of hell explores his solitary flight. So he's going upward. And as he goes upward, he is sort of, weaving from side to side like the town drunk. He is not able to do it. He's not under total control of himself. He's literally flying around and, and struggling to control himself as he goes up. Sometimes he scours the right-hand coast, sometimes the left, now shaves with level wing the deep, then soars up to the fiery concave touring high, and then he's compared to uh, drug traders and so forth as he goes upwards. But as he goes upwards towards the gate, of hell, he encounters a very unusual pair of creatures. And Milton pl plucks these pair of creatures from, I'll put it on here. Yes? What's well, an interesting use, interesting use of inflamed, right? But that's not what you're presumably asking about. Um, his highest design was to uh, grieve God. What 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 don't you understand? I'm confused. It's the language. Oh, sure. He thinks that he's going to bring God down in some ways by bringing his, the, his image bearer down. See, the, he can't get at God. He's already been defeated by God. He knows there's no way he can bring God down. But if there's a creature that bears God's image and he brings him down, God will be grieved. God directly, it can be indirectly attacked by attacking mankind. But it's not saying that God is blaming these thoughts. No. Okay. No. No, that... That is not being said. Sorry, I didn't understand. No, that is not being said. Here we go. Each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. James 1, verse 15. Context. Milton, as he reaches the gates of hell, will encounter two figures. We'll read on. He soars upwards, and at last appear hellbounds, high-reaching to the horrid roof, and thrice threefold the gates. Three folds were brass, three iron, three of adamantine rock, impenetrable, impaled with circling fire, yet unconsumed. Before the gates, there sat on either side a formidable shape. 
The one seemed woman to the waist and fair, but ended foul in many a scaly fold, voluminous and vast, a serpent armed with mortal sting. So it's a woman, but it's a woman that's serpentine from the waist down. A serpent armed with mortal sting about her middle round, a cry of hellhounds never ceasing barked it with wide Siberian mouths full loud and rung a hideous peal. Yet when they list, that is, they heard something, they would creep, if aught disturbed their noise, into her womb and kennel there. Yet there still barked and howled within unseen. So there's a figure there, horrible picture. Hellhounds going within the womb of this woman serpent. Far less abhorred than these vexed Scylla, reference to um, Ovid, also reference to the Odyssey, Scylla and Charybdis, this horrible being, bathing in the sea that parts Calabria from the horse Trinacrian shore off the west coast of Italy. Nor uglier follow the night hag when, come, when called in secret, riding through the air, she comes lured with the smell of infant blood to dance with Lapland witches while the laboring moon eclipses at their charms. So there's the one. Remember, it says there's two figures. The other shape. Line 666. The other shape, if shape it might be called that shape had none distinguishable in member, joint, or limb, or substance might be called that shadow seemed, for each seemed either. Black it stood as night, fierce as ten furies, terrible as hell, and shook a dreadful dart. What seemed his head the likeness of a kingly crown had on. Satan was now at hand, and from his seat the monster, moving onward, came as fast with horrid strides. Hell trembled as he strode. The undaunted fiend, what this might, what this might be, admired, admired, not feared. God and his son accept. Created thing not valued he, nor shunned, and with disdainful look thus first began. Whence... And what art thou, execrable shape that darest, though grim and terrible advance, thy miscreated front athwart my way to yonder gates? Through them I mean to pass, that be assured, without leave asked of thee. Retire or taste thy folly and learn by proof, hell-born, not to contend with spirits of heaven. So, before he was happy to say the mind is its own place, doesn't, no matter where, doesn't matter where I be, but when he confronts a creature which clearly is born in hell, he wants to pull rank, say, do you know who, you, you know who you're dealing with? I'm, I'm from heaven. I'm not from this place like you, you rotten, miscreated fiend. <laughs> you know, get back, or I'm going to show you who's the boss here. You know, give you an epic beatdown. So we have these, this clash imminent here between two beings. But who, who is this being that we have here? Note the description here. The woman, yes, we had, but the other, which is a shapeless shape. It seems like it has a head and a crown on that head, but it's not really a, it's a shape that is indistinguishable. Now, when you are uh, hearing noises in the night, what, what's the response to noises in the night? Things that you can't see, can't quite make out. It's terror. People are afraid of things they can't see. In, in uh, horror movies like Jaws, they have a dun, 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 dun. I don't, you probably, it's way like 1970s. But there's something below the surface and you know it's there, but you don't see it. That's terrifying. When the fin pops up out of the water, not nearly as scary. You, at least you can see, oh, it's there. But before that, it can be anywhere, and you're looking around and terrifying. Here is a shape that has no shape. If you want to see a, a portrait that is similarly portrayed, I think, uh, and I think he gets it from here, Tolkien's Balrog is modeled after this figure, I think. It's a shape, a shapeless shape, a, a, a horror. And what the horror is, is actually death. And note the passage I mentioned in James 15, 115, 
Desire when it is conceived gives birth to sin, and sin when it is fully grown brings forth death. Well, how is Milton going to account for this? He says, you know, whence and what art thou? Boy, you're ugly. You're, you're so ugly. To whom the goblin full of wrath replied, Art thou that traitor angel? Art thou he who first broke peace in heaven and faith? Till then unbroken and in proud rebellious arms drew after him the third part of heaven's sons conjured against the highest. Note he presents them as a, as a witch here. You conjured them, you bewitched them. For which both thou and they, outcast from God, are here condemned to waste eternal days in woe and pain, and wreckst thou self, thyself with spirits of heaven, hell doomed, and breathes defiance here and scorn, where I reign king, and to enrage thee more, thy king and lord. He thought he was presenting himself as, I'm the king of hell, I'm the king of, well, actually, you're not. You, you're not in charge here either. All this is a rebuke to Satan. He has no power whatsoever. He's a drudge. He's a servant. He's even a servant to, to death. Back to thy punishment, false fugitive, and to thy speed add wings, lest with a whip of scorpions I pursue thy lingering. Or with one stroke of this dart, strange horror seize thee in pangs unfelt before. So spake the grisly terror, and in shape, so speaking and so threatening, grew tenfold more dreadful and deformed. On the other side, incensed with indignation, Satan stood unterrified, and like a comet burned. That fires the length of Ophiuchus strange in the Arctic sky, and from his horrid hair shakes pestilence and war. Each at the head leveled his deadly aim, their fatal aims no second stroke in ten, and such a frown each cast at the other as when two black clouds with heaven's artillery fraught come rattling on over the Caspian. So storm clouds about to meet, and the epic storm that's about to ensue. And at that point, the mighty combatants frowning such that hell grew darker at their frown, so matched they stood. For never but once more was either like to meet so great a foe, and now great deeds had been achieved, whereof all hell had rung, had not the snaky sorceress that sat fast by hell gate and kept the fatal key risen, and with hideous outcry rushed between. O oh, father, what intends thy hand, she cried against thy only son. The ugly guy? The father? What fury, O son, possesses thee to bend that mortal dart against thy father's head? And knowst for whom? For him who sits above and laughs the while at thee ordained his drudge to execute whate'er his wrath which he calls justice bids. His wrath which one day will destroy ye both. Says death says sin, rather. One day you're both, he's going to take you both out. Now you're fighting amongst, it's a family feud. Come on! Dad! Son! So she spake, and at her words, the hellish pest forbore when these, to her, Satan returned. So strange thy outcry, and thy words so strange thou interposest, that my sudden hand prevented, spares to tell thee yet by deeds what it intends. Till first I know of thee, what thing art thou art, thus double formed, woman, serpent, and why in this infernal veil, first met, thou callest me father, and that phantasm calls my son. I know thee not, nor ever saw till now a sight more detestable than him and thee. Satan's full of compliments today. Son, you're the ugliest thing ever, and you, I'm... To whom thus the portress of hell gate replied, smoothing her hair, Hast thou forgot me then? And do I seem now in thine eyes so foul, once deemed so fair in heaven, when at the assembly and in sight of all the seraphim with thee, combined in bold conspiracy against heaven's king, all on a sudden miserable pain surprise thee, dim thine eyes and dizzy swum in darkness, while thy head flames thick and fast 
through forth till on the left side opening wide likest to thee in shape and countenance bright then shining heavenly fair a goddess armed out of thy head I sprung now what's the allusion to here do you know this from classical mythology Athena. Athena the goddess of wisdom which springs from Zeus's head Milton takes that mythological account of the birth of Athena the goddess of wisdom to create here sin where did sin originate from Satan's thoughts and the thoughts were of rebellion against God this is a sort of wisdom what happens next nothing that happened in the pagan account by the way <laughs> but she springs out of her head amazement seized all the host of heaven back they recoiled afraid at first and called me sin and for a sign portentous held me but familiar grown I pleased and with attractive glances one the most of us, thee chiefly. Who full oft thyself in me, thy perfect image, viewing becamest enamored. And with such joy thou tookst with me in secret that my womb conceived a growing burden. So, what do we have? Incest except it's a little bit more complicated than that. It is his daughter, but it's his own image. And really what he loves is himself. So this is the perversion of Satan. Satan loves no one but himself. Now, Martin Luther in his epistle on the Romans talks about sin and he uses this phrase, which I'm sure Milton must be referring to here. He describes sin as being curved in upon ourselves, in se curvatus curved in upon ourselves, self-regarding, regarding ourselves as our God. Self as God. What's Adam and Eve's sin? They want to be as gods, determining good and evil. They want to set themselves as the deity in their lives. They don't want God, they want to be God. It's connected with, with the apple. The apple doesn't do anything to them per se because it's not a poison apple. It doesn't, doesn't bring about death. It's what they think, if I eat it, I'm gonna die. Oh, I didn't die. Well, you did, but it's not the way you thought it was gonna be. It's, it's a little bit more complicated than that. But this particular sin is connected to the love of the image. Now remember, Adam and Eve are gonna be described, and they certainly are in scripture, but we'll see elsewhere in the Milton's text as well, as being creatures made in the image of God. How does God treat his image bearers as opposed to how Satan treats his own image bearer? This is part of the perversion and Milton's brilliance here is, is teasing out that biblical text and pushing it in a direction probably not intended uh, in James. He, he personifies sin and death here. They, they become persons in his epic as, as if they were actors on the, on the grand stage. It's a way of portraying it. Now we saw that last semester when we looked at Every man that death was personified came out and spoke, said, your time is to come with me. Sin has never been portrayed as a, as a being in, in my knowledge. This is Milton's own invention. And, and as I say, the biblical text where he seems to give rise to this, this is the text, but he amplifies it in ways, extraordinary ways, imaginative ways, uh, is to connect that with the myth of the birth of, of Athena from the side, from the thoughts of Zeus but to pervert it in, in, again, in quite extraordinary ways. And so this vivid image here. And what we have is an infernal trinity now. We have a father, we have a child, and then we have the love child. And, the, and they're corrupt, and they're in some ways opposed to the holy trinity. You don't want to see them as equal and opposite, but there's a, a sort of an analogy going on here, and it's an analogy of perversion. It grew a, grew a, bo a growing burden. Meanwhile, war arose. This is the account of what happens in book five, which we will hear later. Uh, and the account of her birth, for, furthermore, is told in book five. Meanwhile, war arose, the f and fields were fought in heaven, wherein remained for what could else, to our almighty foe, clear victory. Of course, he's almighty. <laughs> You're going to fight against the Almighty, you're going to lose. To our part, loss 
and route through all the empyrean. Down they fell, driven headlong from the pitch of heaven, down into this deep. And in the general fall, I also, at which time this powerful key into my hand was given. Satan's got the key, or rather sin has the key to hell. With charge to keep these gates forever shut, which none can pass without my opening. How do you go to hell? Through sin. Sin will bring you down there. She's the one that opens the door and you welcome down. Okay. Pensive. Here I sat alone, but long I sat not till my womb pregnant by thee and now excessive grown, prodigious motion felt and rueful throes. At last this odious offspring whom thou seest thine own begotten. And as I say, it's echoing the account of the incarnation. Right? The Lord took on flesh and dwelt among us. John 1, 14. John 3, 16. Breaking violent way tore through my entrails. So it's not a birth. It's a, like, tore through her entrails. Because out it comes. And because of that, then the serpent's tail arises. This is a woman before. But afterwards, this, this horrid being, breaking way through my, tore my entrails, that with fear and pain distorted, all my nether shape thus grew transformed. But he, my inbred enemy, you know, this is the terror, this is the further horror here, my inbred enemy, forth issued, brandishing his de de fatal dart, made to destroy, I fled and cried out, death. Hell trembled at the hideous name and sighed from all her caves and back resounded, death. I fled, but he pursued through more, it seems, in flame with lust than rage. Uh-oh. So if you thought the picture was bad enough with incest, now the, now the, the child death is going to also rape his mother. And, and horrid things ensue. Worse than that, hourly conceived and hourly born with sorrow infinite to me, for when they list into the womb that bred them, they return and howl and gnaw my bowels. Their repast, their food, they're eating her. Then bursting forth afresh with conscious terrors, vex me round that rest or intermission. None I find. Before mine eyes in opposition sits grim death, my son and foe, who sets them on. And me, his parent, would full soon devour for want of other prey, but that he knows his end with mine involved. You destroy sin and you will die as well, because there's no death without sin. You consume death, you consume sin rather, so that sin is gone, there is no more death. It's a spiritual progeny, right? One day, and this is important, when, when Christ at the cross dies, he will destroy sin and the consequences of sin, which is death. That's part of the undoing of the resurrection, right? He pays the price for our sin, but he, in his death and rising from death, destroys the consequences of death, etc., and the consequences of sin. Those will once be totally eradicated in the new heaven and the new earth. But Milton is amplifying this, and this it's quite extraordinary, I think. And he, but he knows that if he eats me, he's done. I would prove a bitter morsel and his bane, whenever that shall be. So fate pronounce. But thou, O Father, I forewarn thee, shun his deadly arrow. Neither vainly hope to be invulnerable in those bright arms, though tempered heavenly for that mortal dint. Save he who reigns above, none can resist. No one but God can be immune to the effects of the dart that death holds. None. So watch out. And what he learns from this, Satan, is, okay, first of all, he finds out who they are, but now what am I going to propose to them? He proposes that they join his scheme. If you join with me, death, I'll give you all the food you ever want. You've got... You've got a card that you can keep on swiping and it's death. I'll bring as many people here as you want and sin you can get out of here and you can go forth in the world. They're both thrilled at that. He paves a highway to hell of asphalt, interestingly, so that it's easy to get down there after that. So he creates this highway and goes up towards earth. That's where we leave it off in book two. Did I say we get on to book three in this? I think I did, right? Yeah. 
Okay, so, but that's where any comments or questions about book two. I will tell you that in anthologies, I've taught this for years now, and in anthologies, they cut out that section of Satan, sin, and death, which to me is extraordinary. How, how can you cut that section out? Yes? Death is God's servant, uh, just as Satan is and just as sin. Everything is God's servant. God is in control. Now, it doesn't make him the author of evil, evil but it does mean that um, nothing happens without God's awareness and permission. Now, at, the po at this point in the narrative, uh, sin and death are not acting the way sin and death do. They're confined to hell. They can't get out of there. They're at the gate of that. It's Satan that's going to loose them from that. Now, again, you're not going to find that in Scripture. Other than in, in James, where it talks about sin, um, conceived giving birth to sin, and sin when it's fully grown brings forth death. That would be the only text. But you're not going to find it in Genesis 1 to 3. He's just accounting for how the thing that is called death, which was not in the world before sin, that we do find. That's the that's the threat of if you eat of that forbidden fruit, you will die. They're not going to die before that. If you eat of that, you will die. And then they do die. Why do they die? Because they commit sin. So again, there's a, an order here. Now, Milton portrays it as a, 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 in a geographical, his, you know, chronological putting this before it and presents them, personifies them. This is a, a very imaginative way of presenting the whole episode. Don't think that this is um, what actually happened. This is not a historical uh, portrait. Any more than in every man, God sends death and then death comes along and at the end of your life, he's gonna say, okay, come along with me. You're gonna see the Grim Reaper. That's, it's an imaginative way of saying, God, everyone is going to meet death. You're gonna die, but it's personifying it. Persuasive, powerful for that reason. Yes, please. Um, yeah, I'm not very familiar with uh, Greek or Roman mythology, but I'm just wondering if you think, or even the context surrounding like Milton's epic, but I was just wondering if there's any significance of sin being portrayed as a woman. And I feel like that conversation is very, um, what do you call it? Very prevalent in like this time, but I don't know if it was the same back then, because if it's like a perversion of the Trinity, you would think like it would all be men or like, I'm just curious. Yeah, so fair enough. If it were an exact uh, analogy, then you would expect them to be all male, not men, but male, just like the Trinity, Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Um, I guess Milton probably derives that, and I mentioned this last time from uh, Revelation 12. So let me put that up, because it, it's an important, another important text, I think, to be seen here. Uh, sure, we'll use the King James, why not? Right, there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, the moon upon her feet, and her, upon her head a crown of twelve stars. She being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered, and there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads in heaven. Okay, and a tail drawing the third part of the stars. So the, the uh, figure here was the great red dragon will be Satan. But the woman, anyway, I don't want to get into the whole exegesis of Revelation 12. But what we find in Revelation is that there's a reference to uh, two women. Two. One of them is the bride of Christ, the heavenly Jerusalem. The other is Babylon the Great, who's a whore. That is, I think, what Milton is referring to as the, the woman of sin here. Is the, um, now there, the, the, the uh, woman is personified as a city, even. And not just a city, a whole civilization. 
with that. Just like Jerusalem represents the whole of Israel, it's the capital city, capital means the head, in the same way that. And so I think Milton is just following biblical language on this. Same thing you would find in the book of Proverbs if you're interested in, in it. There, there are two women, Proverbs 1 to 9, and, and, and they're calling out in the streets. One of them is, is, is a whore, once again, calling upon the young man to um, try her goods. You know, sample some of these. And then there's another woman that's calling out in the streets, and she's Lady Wisdom. Which one of them? And he says, and, and the wise counsel says, <laughs> go with that one and ignore, you stay away from that lady. But in both cases, it's, it's personified, either wisdom or folly is personified in feminine form. And connected, of course, folly then with sin. More, uh, uh, but we tend to want to take the analogy and apply it too rigorously and think that he's talking about men and women. I think that's a serious misreading and, uh, and goes against the intention of scripture to do that. It's just traditional language. And note that wisdom is often personified as women in, in uh, classical mythology even, as is Athena, goddess of wisdom. Um, so if you don't like the idea that sin or folly is presented as a woman, then I guess you're not gonna like wisdom being <laughs> personified as a woman, uh, which in, in one sense, it's suggesting the importance of faithfulness on an even um, physical level in terms of covenant fidelity and so forth. There's more to wisdom than simply an intellectual thing. It's a, it's a lived out um, life experience. And I think that fits in very well with the idea of, of marital relations and so forth. Anyway, is that helpful at all? But I mean, it's a good question. Why is this portrayed in, in, in feminized form? And I think that's the reason Milton's just following um, traditional texts on this. Yes? Just to add to that, it's interesting that sin is what leads to death and what leads to salvation is grace. And grace is personified as a woman as well, at least in a feminine sense. I, I don't hear it. Often. Well, in, in Milton. Yes. Yes, yeah. So one of our problems in reading this text in the 21st century is that the feminist discourse is so dominated um, the ways of reading for a long time that we don't like any gendered language whatsoever, let alone a sense that uh, one's good and one's evil. And as I say, I think it's pretty easy using the biblical text and even the classical text to show that it's not talking about women and men per se, but it is talking and using the language of, of, of fidelity and using male-female relations as that touchstone. Yeah. Uh, a very complex subject, and when, when you get into it, well, what does that mean then on a, on a personal human level? That becomes even more complicated then. But for, for this, and I could say a lot about that, but we're not gonna get into that here uh, because it's off topic. But, but you're right, he deviates from the exact representation. And it, the words in, infernal trinity were my words, it's not in the text. I just see an, there's a clear threesome here and there's a clear trinity uh, in uh, book three, which we come to now, by the way. So let me see, we'll spend We've only got a few minutes here, at least the beginnings in book three. We're now in heaven. Because book three, the argument is that God sees Satan flying towards this world, then newly created, shows him to the son who sat at his right hand. Note that sin was on Satan's left side. Foretells the success of Satan in perverting mankind, clears his own justice and wisdom from all imputation, having created man free and able enough to have withstood his tempter, yet declares his purpose of grace towards him. In regard, he fell not of his own mal malice, as did Satan, but by him seduced. Okay, so he, in, he sees, foresees the successful temptation and pronounces that he will be gracious to mankind before the fall even happens. So, all of these things are theological uh, assertions on Milton's part. 
and reflecting probably Puritan, uh, the Puritan convictions that before there was ever a sinner on earth, there was a savior in heaven. The lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world, it says in Revelation. You know that text? One of the bugbears for every Arminian. The slayed from the foundation of the world. Like, what's going on there? You mean God knew what was coming and prepared a solution to the problem of sin before it even happened? God foreknew all these things. Remember God's outside space and time. It's really hard to conceive of this on our human level. It's very, I mean, it's impossible. But if you, if you understand that God is omniscient, not just uh, omnipotent, but omniscient, and he stands outside created being, remember his being is not created. We have created being. He creates us. We, he gives us our human being. His being is uncreated. The creator it exists before anything else is created, including Satan and all the other things. Heaven and earth. God is. He pre-exists what we call existence. And he foresees what is going to happen in time before it ever happens. And yet we have this distinct sense that part of human nature is to be, have a sense of freedom, which would suggest the opposite, that God can't foreknow that, because to foreknow it would be to determine it in some ways. And so we get the, the, the interminable debate between the Calvinists and the Arminians about how God's foreknowledge can allow for human freedom. It can't be so. It's going to have to be one or the other. But if you err on the freedom side, you make God into, he's a bystander just waiting around to see what decisions you and I make. And then you'll say, okay, that's the way it's going to be. But he's not involved and he does not uh, involve himself in the, in the created order whatsoever after he's created. He's a blind watchmaker. He sets it in motion and then stands back and waits to see what happens. That's, I'll just submit to you that that's not the portrait in scripture. Simply not. Um, people talk about coming to faith, coming to Jesus. In the accounts in scripture, Jesus goes around and picks his disciples. You, and you, and you, and you up in the tree. Yeah, you, you thought you were looking at me. I see you. In fact, and he knew what he, where he was before, right? I saw you. Whoa, I know who you are. You must be God, because no one could have seen that, because you, physically you could not see it, but you knew. He chooses all of his disciples sovereignly. Uh, that has huge implications for your life. If you've come to faith, it's because God has reached out and grasped you and brought you to him, and you are united with him. That means you can't lose him as well. It's a good thing. He found you. You found him back, of course. It's a big hug, and you hug back, yes. But he's the one who initiated it. It's very encouraging stuff. Uh, that is how Milton's going to portray it. And nonetheless, he's going to defend freedom here as intrinsic to human nature. And th this is why he creates this scenario where there is a fruit place in the garden that is forbidden to mankind. Now, we'll look at Milton's explanation. For, before I get to the theology, I need to deal with the invocation. This is a second invocation. We had the first one in book one, lines one to 26. Here we have a second one, and he does it because he's just come up from hell. And remember, Milton, the sinner, needs to describe things that no eye has ever seen. And he needs divine inspiration. He needs God's illumination to see what, and to present to other people what he thinks is beyond his ability to do. So Milton himself speaks here. Hail, holy light, all spring of heaven's firstborn, or of the eternal, co-eternal being, may I express thee unblamed, since God is light, and never but in unapproached light dwelt from eternity, dwelt then in thee. Bright effluence of bright essence in create. Or rather that, or hearst thou rather pure ethereal stream, whose fountain, who shall tell? Before the sun, before the heavens thou wert, 
And at the voice of God, as with a mantle didst invest the rising world of waters, dark and deep, one from the void and formless infinite. Thee I revisit now with bolder wing, escaped the Stygian pool, though long detained in that obscure sojourn, while in my flight through utter and through middle darkness born with other notes than to the Orphean lyre, I sung of chaos and eternal night. Taught by the heavenly muse to venture down the dark descent and up to reascend, though hard and rare, thee I revisit safe and feel thy sovereign vital lamp. He's referring to the sun now. He feels it on his eyes. He feels it. He doesn't see it. He feels the warmth on his eyes. Maybe his eyes are open. He feels it, but he, can't, he doesn't see the light. His sight is gone. He feels the warmth, and he knows the sun's there because he used to see the sun. He didn't, wasn't born blind. He lost his sight. <laughs> Feel thy sovereign light, but thou revisits not these eyes that roll in vain to find thy piercing ray and find no dawn. So thick a drop serene hath quenched their orbs or dim suffusion veiled. Yet not the more cease I to wander where the muses haunt, clear spring or shady grove or sunny hill, smit with the love of sacred song, but chief thee, Zion, and the flowery brooks beneath that wash thy hallowed feet and warbling flow, nightly I visit. Nor sometimes forget those other two equaled with me in fate, so were I equaled with them in renown. Blind Thamiris and blind Maonides, Maonides and Tiresias and Phineas, prophets old that feed, then feed on thoughts. He cites all sorts of precedents of people who have prophetic vision who were blind and he is comparing himself to them now as the wakeful bird, bird sits darkling and in the shadiest covert hid to, tunes her nocturnal note thus with the year seasons return but not to me returns day or the sweet approach of even or morn or sight of vernal bloom or, bloom, or summer's rose or flocks, or herds, or human face divine. But cloud instead and ever during dark surrounds me from the cheerful ways of men cut off. And for the book of knowledge fair, presented with a universal blank, of nature's works to me expunged and raised. They've totally wiped it out. It's like a whiteboard. It's been wiped clean. He sees nothing. The book of knowledge of nature looking around at human beings bear the image of God. Books, it's all gone. He sees nothing. So much the rather thou celestial light shine inward and the mind through all her powers irradiate. There plant eyes, all mist from thence, purge and disperse that I may see and tell of things invisible to mortal sight. So it's a terrific meditation on his own blindness and on the blindness that comes from sin and he wants to be uh, removed from both of those because he's going to portray heaven and who has ever done such a thing what poet dante did not do this the way the way milton is going to do it dante did not do this he did not portray god speaking there, at, the, at the end of the uh, Divine Comedy in Paradiso, we get a vision of the Trinity, like circles, but it's a, it's a mystical portrait, and there's no speech. God is going to be presented as a character in Milton's drama here. Now, he, he was, in, as I say, in the, uh, the medieval mystery play where he speaks briefly, right? Milton falls in the, that path of presenting God with language. And there is great danger in this. And, and Milton, the, the criticism that Milton has got from, on, from uh, this passage comes from other Christians. How dare you present God as a character in your work? This, this, you run the risk of blasphemy. Um, others have said that Milton's God sounds like a theologian which is a pretty, dam <laughs> pretty damnable uh, charge. You sound like a theologian. Okay, that's not bad, is it? Well, he's a correct theologian, yes, 
but you lose the sense of awesome, transcendent, incomprehensible. Presumably Milton's God is going to be orthodox. I think he is. I think he presents himself well. But you lose the sense of, um, as I say, transcendence and a little bit of the sense of awe when he becomes a character in the story. Um, so some have been very dismayed by the, the very attempt, but they will say, if you are going to attempt such a thing, then this is magnificently done. Anyway, now he begins the narrative. I have 10 minutes. Now had the, and I'll pick it up next time. Now had the almighty power from above, from the pure Empyrean where he sits, high throned above all height, right? We want to see God is above us. And this is important, by the way. He's superior in every sense. We look up. There's something about God being residing in heaven above all height that is helpful, spiritually helpful. But he's above all height. What does that even mean? Like a height above height. Say it can't, it's, a, it's a paradox. High throned above all height, bent down his eye, his own works and their works at once to view. About him all the sanctities of heaven stood thick as stars, and from his sight received beatitude past utterance. On his right the radiant image of his glory sat, his only son. On earth he first beheld our two first parents, yet the only two of mankind in the happy garden placed, reaping immortal fruits of joy and love, uninterrupted joy, unrivaled love, in blissful solitude. He then surveyed hell and the gulf between, and Satan there coasting the wall of heaven on this side, night, in the dun air sublime, and ready now to stoop with wearied wings and willing feet on the bare outside of this world, that seemed fair land in bosom without firmament, uncertain which in ocean or in air. He's never seen the earth. He doesn't know the difference between the land and the water. He might land on the water and go down. It's like Him God beholding from his prospect high, wherein for past, present, future he beholds. Thus to his only son foreseeing spake. So here's Milton's challenge. It's not just that he presents God as a character. It's that he presents a being that is outside space and time speaking in space and time. That alone ruins the whole thing, right? It, it creates a problem. He just becomes another character. He's the best character, but he's a character. He's personifying God. All the same, Milton is trying to guard against misrepresenting this because he again, he presents God beholding the past, the present, and the future. So in other words, it, it's, it's not a contradiction for God to see what is going to come, nor is it an interference. It's just, of course, he knows everything. So he's not, he doesn't think in space and time the way we do. Only begotten son, seest thou what rage transports our adversary, him whom no bounds prescribe, no bars of hell, nor all the chains heaped on him there, nor yet the main abyss. Wide interrupt can hold. So bent he seems on desperate revenge that shall redound upon his own rebellious head. And now through all restraint broke loose, he wings his way not far off heaven in the precincts of light, directly towards the new created world and man there placed with purpose to assay if him by force he can destroy or worse by some false guile pervert. And immediately, and shall pervert. Can I try it? And he'll succeed. And shall pervert, for man will hearken to his glozing lies and easily transgress the sole command, sole pledge of his obedience, so will fall he and his faithless progeny, all of us. Whose fault? Now here begins the theologian. Whose fault? Whose but his own? In great, he had of me all he could have. I made him just and right, sufficient to have stood though free to fall famous line 
made him just and right, sufficient to have stood, but free to fall. Such I created all the ethereal powers and spirits, both them who stood and them who failed. Freely they stood who stood, and fell who fell. Not free, what proof could they have given sincere of true allegiance, constant faith, or love, where only what they needs must do appeared, not what they would. So to bear the image of God is to have freedom, because God has freedom. God is in his character love. To love is to choose. Choose. You can't love without choice. It's, it's connected to it. So is being made in the image of God. Freedom is part of that picture. If we don't like having choice, we also don't like being made in the image of God. We like that very much. We like it so much that we want to get rid of the idea that we're the image. We want to be the whole thing. We're, we're happy with that. We're also happy with the freedom. We just don't like the bad consequences of a, of a choice. Right. But he says, if I had not done this, what praise could they receive? What pleasure I from such obedience paid, where will and reason, reason also is choice, useless and vain of freedom both despoiled, made passive both, had served necessity, not me. So if they had no choice, they just, they're going to love me because I made them, but they, well, they're, of course they're going to love me. There's no way they can demonstrate anything else, so there has to be a choice to demonstrate they love me for my sake. So that's what it's there. It's a pledge of their obedience and, and their loyalty. And they have everything from God. There's this one thing that he forbids them, and it's simply there to show that they have freedom to love him for his own sake. And otherwise, there's no way of doing that. He wants it because God wants love, because he's loving and they bear his image. And he wants to give them the delight of choosing him for his own sake. If he did not give them that choice, they would not have had the excellence of love, which is prized in every culture in its love poetry, its love lyrics. Love is seen as the pinnacle of human life. Everywhere. We value freedom, we value love. That comes with consequences. You can fail, you can misuse it. And if I had not given them this, they had served necessity, not me. They therefore, as to right belonged, so were created, nor can justly accuse their maker or their making or their fate as if predestination overruled their will. Disposed by absolute decree, of or high foreknowledge. They themselves decreed their own revolt, not I. If I foreknew, which he did, <laughs> if I foreknew, foreknowledge had no influence on their fault, which had no less proved certain, unforeknown. So without least impulse or shadow of fate, or aught by me immutably foreseen, they trespass authors to themselves and all what they judge and what they choose. For so I form them free, and free they must remain till they enthrall themselves. They're created free. But once they sin, they are no longer free in this way. And we are no longer free in this way either, by the way. I will say furthermore. The idea of free will, which is presented as a, a doctrine of human nature now, is, a, is misrepresenting the, the facts of the case. We are enslaved to sin. We are not our own masters. We do not choose freely in this sense. It's not just the limitation of a created being. We are mood motivated by sin in our choices. Not wholly necessarily, but substantially. But, so this is what it means by, by, the, by total depravity. It's not that people are as bad as they could be. It's that every aspect of their choices is uh, is uh, affected by sin. There's something of sin in every choice we make, except one, when we come to faith, because God is the author of that coming to faith. He, he gives the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit brings us to faith in God. It's not our choice, it's his choice. We respond to the liberation of the gift of the Holy Spirit with an equal embrace. We come to life. What's the consequence of sin? Death. What can a dead person do to come to life? Nothing. 
if you're dead in your sins, you're not going to come to life from your own efforts. Not possible. But God, the author of life, can free you from sin and bring you to faith. And then you have life. The life that he bestows, the life that he gives, the life that you enjoy, the life as a Christian is, is a gift of God. So that is M Milton's doctrine here, and he's presenting it very clearly, I think. But they are author to themselves in all what they judge and they choose. I form them free. They had absolute choice, and they're free until they enthrall themselves. At that point, they are no longer free. Paul will talk about this. Have a look at yourself in Romans 7. He says, you're either slaves to sin or slaves to righteousness. Where's the talk of freedom there? You have two choices. Are you, gonna be, are you, are you a slave to sin or are you a slave to righteousness? And if you're a slave to righteousness, it's because the righteous one has set you free. And you are free insofar as you cling to righteousness. And that's why you need to repent daily. Anyway, I else must char change their nature and revoke the high decree unchangeable, eternal, which ordained their freedom. They themselves ordained their fall. And now he's going to refer to Satan and the others. The first sort by their own suggestion fell, self-tempted, self-depraved. Man falls deceived by the other first. Man, therefore, shall find grace. The other, none. In mercy and justice, both. Through heaven and earth, so shall my glory excel. But mercy, first and last, shall brightest sign, shine. Now, he says this before anything happens. He's going to show mercy to God. This is the Father. There's no incarnation yet. Don't jump ahead on this. The Father has decreed that mercy will be shown to mankind. The Father loves mankind and wants to show him mercy. There's no contradiction between the Son and what he does and what the Father wills. The Son always acts in accordance with the Father's will, right? He says that in Scripture repeatedly. I've done nothing but what the Father sent me to do. And that's to show mercy. But it was decreed by the Father, first of all. So there's no contradiction here within the Godhead. There's nothing of the Old Testament God who's angry and wrathful and the New Testament God who's merciful and Somehow they're, they're at war with one another in this crazy reading of Scripture that we see as an old test, as a heresy in the early church. Yes, comment or question? In the middle earlier, you had said that mankind was made in the image of God and it was made them different from the angels. Yes. Was the angels made in the image of God and it was made them different from the angels? Yes. Was their freedom? So if mankind. Well, not, the, the angels are not made in the image of God. Yes, uh, because they, the image of God is defaced but not effaced. It's marred by sin. We, we cannot forfeit the image of God. However depraved you are, however depraved anyone is, and we see some people who are horribly depraved, that person still bears the image of God. It is not for us to take justice into our own hands and persecute that person, even if they're a, a terrible person, there needs to be justice done to that person, but it's in keeping with the fact that that person is an image bearer of God. So, uh, no mob justice. There needs to be a hearing. There's somebody here who bears the image of God who needs to be demonstrated, shown the fact that they're a sinner and be given the opportunity to repent. That's the Christian response. They also need justice to be done for the actions they've committed. Maybe they've murdered somebody. That person who's been murdered was also an image bearer of God. So there needs to be justice in an earthly sense for that person as well. Maybe it's a capital punishment. First degree murder. You've taken somebody who bears the image of God and you've taken their life. Okay, well then for first degree murder, a life for a life. Yes. But again, we, don't, we can't just take vengeance onto ourselves because that person bears the image of God. In Canada, a uh, maximum security cell, I don't, my, my figures are out of date. They used to cost about 100,000 to build and 100,000 to maintain every year. And the rate of recidivism, that is repeat offenses for people who are thrown into maximum security, because you don't spend your life, a life sentence, you don't spend in prison. Um, the rate of recidivism is well over 90%. So the question is, why would you build a jail cell 
that, at that cost and keep somebody there at that cost, and I say it's much more now than when I looked at this, if you knew that when the person got out they were going to repeat their offense, why would you do that? On the one hand, why wouldn't you just shoot them dead on the spot, just bang, it's cheap, the bullet's not expensive. On the other hand, why would you put them into prison at all? If the effect of putting somebody in maximum security prison is that the person ends up being as bad, if not worse, when they get out, what's the purpose of that? Well, it's because we have a justice system and we have a sense of, of an attempt to rectify the human condition, but that person bears the image of God. Now, countries that do not believe that human beings bear the image of God execute their prisoners immediately as political enemies and so forth. There's no trial, there's no process, it's just bang. It's cheap, it's easy, it's quick. We have a higher regard for human life. At least we say we do, and in some senses we do. I think there are huge contradictions to that in abortion and other things. That's, but, that, the, but the point is we have a sense of the image of God and the value of a human person in the way we treat one another. That's a, that is, a, I would have said, at one point would have been a hallmark of the Western world. It, it is no longer so as we descend further into civilizational darkness, but that's another topic altogether. I can talk about it at some length at some other stage, but we're done. I've overshot my time. Thank you. Uh, next